Um, I'd, um, I'd like to, um, to give a very warm welcome to everybody uh, this evening. I'm Adam Tickell. I'm the, uh, the new Vice Chancellor of the University and um, it's a huge pleasure for me to be able to welcome you all here uh, to celebrate the uh, professorial lecture um, of David Tal. Um, so the, I have to say it's the first professorial lecture I've hosted and it'll, I am confident it'll be one of many. Um, and professorial lectures are a great moment in the life of any university and a great moment in the life of this university. Um, they're moments when we uh, get to learn about the work of our professors. They're moments when we get to celebrate in the achievements of our professors and also in the achievement of the university in either recruiting or promoting people um, of distinction. Um, and of course it's a great pleasure therefore to be able to introduce our speaker, uh, David Tal. Um, David joined us um, in, well, it says here 2014, but he's just told me it was a little bit earlier than that, um, in 2013, uh, taking the newly established uh, Yossi Harrell Chair in Israel Studies, in Modern Israel Studies. Um, this chair was created to help the Sussex develop its base in modern Middle Eastern history. Um, and the, the, the chair itself has a particular reference to the politics, history, and society of contemporary Israel. Um, this is obviously a period of huge social and political change in the region um, and, a, and obviously there are huge challenges um, for the whole of the Middle East. Um, and at this period, at this time, the development of our research across the spectrum um, is timely and complements our tradition of engaging with urgent and complex issues. Um, David was an outstanding candidate for the role. He was educated at the uh, Tel Aviv University, um, has held several positions in universities in Israel, the United States and Canada, and his focus, as you know, is on uh, the Middle East and military security. His professional roles include um, being on the editorial advisory board of the Encyclopedia of the Cold War, um, and he's been a research fellow uh, for NATO. Um, he's published uh, voluminously, so I can just give you a flavour, um, including a book on the American disarmament dilemma uh, after, from 1945 to 1963, um, in which he examined how and why nuclear disarmament policies failed following the, uh, the atomic bomb uh, that was dropped on Hiroshima and, of course, Nagasaki, um, and the war in Palestine, 1948, in which he involved the Arab involvement uh, in the Jewish-Palestinian conflict. And this, and this work, as well as many others, has helped, him to helped establish him as an expert in nuclear proliferation um, and disarmament, as well as the diplomatic and military history of Israel. His latest book will be published in July next year, um, and it continues the theme on uh, the US strategic arms policy in the Cold War, negotiation and confrontation over SALT. And particularly for anybody under 30, you'll get a prize at the end if you can remember what SALT stands for. Um, his many published papers have looked in depth at the range of military and Middle East, uh, range of military and Middle Eastern issues, and he's sought to understand the causes and consequences of the conflicts um, in these troubled areas. Um, here at Sussex, as, you, as I'm sure you know, he's part of our newly formed Middle East and North Africa Centre, um, and he works with colleagues across the university to explore issues such as the making and unmaking of nature's nation states. Um, before I turn over to him, I want to um, reassure you that David is very happy to take uh, questions at the end. Um, could I ask you to respect uh, David and also everybody else in the room uh, to leave your questions or comments to the end of the talk um, when, as I say, he'll be very happy to, uh, to take any comments. Um, in this evening's lectures, lecture, um, which is, a, I won't read it out, you can read it in front of you, um, David will discuss the sources, of his sources and history of the special relationship uh, between Israel and the United States um, and will argue that a at the heart of these relations lies an American view of Israel and an American view of Zionism. Um, 
which is based upon deep religious and idealistic and of course ideological sentiments and values in what in um, uh, well I'll hand the floor, floor to David he can explain his lecture uh, far better than I can so thanks very much and um, welcome Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, for uh, joining uh, really to this uh, um, very, uh, well, for me, as it's, it was the first uh, professorial uh, talk for Adam, well, it's for me too. It's my first professorial talk, and I'm very, very happy for this opportunity to introduce myself, my work, uh, to you and uh, when I say that uh, I'm happy to introduce my work it is more than one way not only in the sense that uh, you're gonna have an opportunity uh, to hear about one topic which is the making of an ally but uh, actually this work is a work in progress I'm working on this topic now these very days I've written uh, several articles on the topic on American Israeli relationship in various periods and then I said okay this is time to write something comprehensive broad uh, that will kind of in a way sum up the, the way the history the making and the history of the American special relationships but I would like to begin I, I, I change a bit uh, what I plan to say in, in my introduction uh, that was uh, thanks to the people standing outside of the hall I don't know if you uh, met them the people who greeted you with the flag of Palestine and with uh, a brochure um, and, and I would like to say a few words really about, about uh, me uh, being a historian, being Israeli, uh, being uh, holding a chair, which uh, as one of the guys standing outside when I said, you have no idea what I'm going to say today. And he said, well, you are Yossi El Chair in Israeli studies. What can you say? That means, well, you must be, you know, uh, 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 very, it's going to be a very Zionist talk. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I'll leave it to you to judge what kind of talk is it, but I, I would like to say a few words really about the, the place of uh, Israeli studies in American, in a, in a British uh, uh, university. Uh, I took the position uh, uh, three years, about three years ago, coming from a whole different uh, civilization from North America. I came from Canada, before that I was in the United States. The Israeli conflict was always an issue, but not really as a delicate and sensitive issue as it is here in Britain. And, uh, and one of the arguments that usually comes with uh, when, when Israel is, is, is dealt with is, of course, the occupation, civil uh, rights, Palestinians, the apartheid, a lot of uh, issues which are controversial, some would say they are not controversial, it's very clear what it is, some would go against it. But basically, uh, if you are an Israeli, then you must be standing in what side of the map. That's for sure. And certainly, if you uh, carry the title Yossi Arel Chair in Israeli Studies. Now, for those of you who don't really know who is Yossi Arel, because some think that Yossi Arel has to do with the intelligence, the head of the Israeli intelligence, uh, uh, agency in the 1950s. No, Yossi Arel is actually the Paul Newman of Exodus. Did you see Exodus? You know the film Exodus. So Paul Newman is Yossi Arel. He was the commander of the, the, uh, the refugee ship that brought Jews to Palestine in 1947. And the, the, the chair is dedicated to him. But basically, um, for me, when, when, if I need to define myself, and I, I'm not asked to define myself quite frequently, but if I need to define myself, then when I'm standing here in front of you, then I'm first, I'm human being. No, it's not obvious. <laughs> Second, I'm historian. I'm historian. And third, I'm Israeli. This is the kind of the priority uh, list. This is how I see myself. I'm historian. I'm also Israeli. But that has nothing to do with my professional work. And I really don't care about the implications and the meaning of my work. In the sense that if, if my work on Israel proves Israel to be right, be it. If my work proves that Israel is bad, be it. I don't care. This is not my job 
to serve any interest of either aisle, either side of the debate. It really, I couldn't care less. And I know that people used my, my writings in either way. Some found me Zionist and some used me to make anti-Zionist arguments. And I just say, well, once I published my work, it's no longer mine. So you can do whatever you want to do with that, and that's fine. I don't care. So, and the reason, if, you, if, if as Adam mentioned, my work is really on the one hand on Israel, Israel diplomatic military history, but at the same time, it's also on American disarmament. And the reason that I went to that area is that I wanted to experience how is it to write history which is not mine as an Israeli. Because with all the faults I have, I have nothing to do with the United States. As, as, I mean, it's now a topic I'm working on, but, you know, the United States is just for me a place. And for the matter of my research, Israel is also for me just a place. And I learned that while working on nuclear disarmament. The methodology is the same. The way I approach documents is the same. And just to give a good idea, and, and really that will be the last of it, and I'll just jump into my uh, uh, talk. If I would like to argue, for example, that Israel is good, and the document tells me that Israel is bad, then the documents prevail. It's almost as simple as that. Now, did I really succeed doing the things that I'm, I want to do? I don't know. That I'll leave to the judges. Well, it was good enough to bring me to Sussex. Is that a good criteria? I'll leave it to you. I feel blessed. And from here, please let me uh, really take you uh, to the history of the making of the uh, uh, of an ally, the sources and history of Israel-US special relations. And you have to excuse me, I'm going to read my talk, which, which really, it's going to be about 50 minutes, it's going to be maybe a little bit bo uh, boring, but bear with me. Uh, I prefer to do that that way, it will give me better control of the most valuable asset, which is time. So I would like to start with a story. Uh, the 1973, 1973 October War, we are now commemorating uh, uh, that war. The uh, Israeli uh, approach, the Israelis asked the United States to resupply mainly tanks and combat jets that Israel was losing along the Egyptian and the Syrian fronts. And the United States position, which was uh, basically um, uh, decided by President Ris Richard Nixon was, we're going to give you everything you need. The Americans told the Israelis, we give you everything you need, but we will do that only after the war is over, because we don't want to take a side in that war. This is a war between Israel, Egypt, and Syria. We don't want to be perceived as taking side in that war. And Israel fought quite aggressively against that decision. Israeli diplomats, the Israeli ambassador in uh, Washington, Sim Hadinitz, used to meet and talk with uh, uh, the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, almost every day. He would see him quite often, always trying to convince him, no, you need to start say, shipping mainly phantom planes to Israel and right away. On October 12, 1973, Kissinger decided, okay, we have to give something to the Israelis. Sim Hadinitz came to his office at the State Department and uh, Kissinger called the Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger, telling them, okay, you need to start sending two phantoms every day for the next six days. Dinitz interrupted the conversation. He was sitting in the room. He said, no, no way. You're not going to send two phantoms now for six days. You are going to send today 40 phantoms. And Kissinger complied. He said, okay, we'll do that. And that was the beginning of the American airlift to Israel, which continued throughout the whole war and after that. Now that episode raises a question, or at least two questions, which are quite, I find them quite interesting. First, who is the great power and who is the small country? Who gives orders to whom? How come that an ambassador of a small country says, to the Secretary of State, no, you need to do that, and he does. And the second thing is, 
the interest of the United States, as was defined by the President, was that the United States should not supply arms, should not be part of the war. So here, the Secretary of State, of course, under the permission of the President, take an act that basically played against what the United States defined as their national interest. Now, academics and non-academics, they have a, a clear answer. And the answer is it was the work of the Jewish lobby. The Jews were behind that. There was a strong lobby, and that lobby pushed the administration until eventually the administration gave up. I won't go too much into detail over that question of the place of the Jewish lobby in the making of, uh, uh, of, of policy. But before that, I would like to remind or to, now it's a problem, no, it's not. About 11 years before that, in 1962, President Kennedy made that comment when he spoke with the Israeli Foreign Minister, Golda Meir. So in 1962, John F. Kennedy defined the relationship between Israel and the United States as special relations. Was that also the work of the Jewish lobby? Now, the argument about the Jewish lobby is problematic for various reasons. And the most important reason is that it gives too much power, which was not really, did not really exist at that time. And I would like, instead of going and to address the question, what was the place of the Jewish lobby, I would like to take a different path. And that path will be to try to explain what I think are the roots and the way it has been developed, the Israeli-American special relationship. And in order to do that, I would like to introduce a broader anal analyze, analysis of the sources and history of the Israeli-American relations. Based on both Israeli and American documents, usually the literature on the Israeli-American relationship are based on American sources only. So the research basically is a very, very America-centric. And I would like to expand the scope and the, uh, 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 and the framework of the study on American-Israeli relationships, so I'm using Israeli and American sources. And I would like to argue that the American-Israeli relationship has been developed as a process of mutuality. I will outline the religious, ideological, and historical premises upon which those relations were based, and I will show how those premises allowed constant interaction between the two governments. Those premises created, on the one hand, strong commitment on the part of the United States to help the Zionist movement and Israel to achieve their aspirations and to secure Israel's existence. And on the other hand, made American presidents and administrations receptive to Zionist and Israeli statesmen and diplomats and allowed the creation of a constant dialogue between American and Zionist and Israelis. was a kind of a build-up. <laughs> president Woodrow Wilson was the first American president to deal politically with the Zionist movement. That happened at the time when the British government asked for his endorsement of the Balfour Declaration. After a lengthy process in which American Jewish Zionists were involved, most known among them, President Wilson's just a friend, Justice Louis Brandeis, President Wilson granted his support to the declaration. The reasons for his decision were a mixture of religion and idealism. Woodrow Wilson grew up in a religious family. He was a keen and devoted reader of the Bible, and his religious devotion led him to articulate deep Christian sentiment favoring the fulfillment of the biblical prophecy. In 1912, he likened the Jewish longing to their homeland to the spiritual feeling that motivated European immigrants to come to unknown America. With that, 
Wilson tied himself to a tradition that went back to the 17th century and to the Puritans that left mainly England and came to the New World. The rhetoric the Puritans used was biblical. They referred to themselves as the chosen people, singled out by God to be an example for all nations, just like biblical Israel. However, when they claimed that they were new Israel, the Puritans and those who followed them did not mean that the Jews ended up their role in history, a common thought among Catholic Christians and also among Protestants. When they likened themselves to the ancient Israel, the Puritans and their successors thought that the Jews should go back to, the ancient, to their ancient homeland. In fact, Protestant eschatology provided the basis for the appearance of the Gentile Zionists who preceded Theodor Herzl in their call for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. From the very first settlers, the explained historian Hilton Oberzinger, belief in Jewish restoration was endemic to American culture. The call was and still is based on two major undercurrents existing among the evangelical Protestant Americans, the, the, dispens the dispensational premillennialists and the errancy of the Bible. According to the dispens dispensational premillennialism, the time when God would engather the Jewish exiles and would bring them back to their homeland in Palestine was near. The Jewish return would usher an escalated sorry, eschatological process that would lead to the return of Jesus Christ and his thousand year reign. Thus, Christian salvation became dependent on the fate of the Jewish people and their return to the land God promised to them. The other religious group is the fundamentalists who believed in the errancy of the Bible. For them, God's promise to Abraham to your descendants, I will give this land is not just a religious text, but actual political decree and historical truth that should be implemented as written. And here you can see on the map the figures of those who believe in the Bible errancy and those who believe that the fundamentalists who believe that Palestine belongs to the Jews, Israel belongs to the Jews. Believing that and believing God's promise to Abraham was actual political decree. No wonder that Americans, people, and presidents could understand the Jewish claim to territory they occupied by force, even if politically they think that such occupation and hold are problematic. And I'm referring, of course, to the post-1967 war. These tendencies were manifested in the theopolitical rhetoric presidents and officials used to describe their attitude towards Zionism. Expressing his pride in the role he played in the publication of the Balfour Declaration, President Wilson said in wonder, to think that I, the son of the man's, would be able to help to restore the Holy Land to its people. Four centuries later, in November 1953, President Harry Truman was invited to a Jewish, to the Jewish Theological Seminar in New York to meet a group of Jewish dignitaries. His old friend, Eddie Jacobson, introduced him to the, pub, uh, to the audience. This is the man who helped to create the State of Israel. And this is Truman's response. He is Cyrus. President Jimmy Carty, Carter, who at a certain point became a critic of Israel, wrote in his memories, I consider this homeland for the Jews to be incompatible, to be in co uh, compatible with the teaching of the Bible. It might be worth mentioning here that throughout the 19th century, and the first half of the 20th century, most of the evangelical Christians believed that the return of the Jews to their land should be God's work, a way of thinking identical to that of Orthodox Jews. Only few believed that the Christian church should actively assist the Jews to gather back in the land of Israel. However, following the establishment of the State of Israel in May 1948, and even more so in the wake of Israel's territorial expansion following the June 1967 war, more and more evangelical Christians turned to believe that indeed the prophecies were coming true and they shifted their spiritual belief in the return of the Jews to their homeland into active political creed. Wilson's response for the Jewish homeland 
derived from also his ideas about self-determination and the power of democracy. Those ideas were not disconnected from his religion, religious education combined with the political events unfolded in the wake of the First World War. Drawing for his Calvinist doctrine of equal opportunities, which was in the heart of the American evangelism, Wilson believed that essentially all men were capable of self-government. His church, the self-rule Presbyterian church, provided him with an apparent evidence of that ability. In his politics, or theopolitics, Wilson represented and helped to advance the cause of liberalism and republicanism, which led to the creation of a foreign policy that emphasized individual rights and liberties with democracy embodying these rights. This is evident from the following statement President Wilson made. And I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. You can read it. The Zionists use that rhetoric in their diplomatic campaigns. They offer to build the national home for the Jews in Palestine and to substitute the tyrannical Ottoman rule with the liberal democracy messages that fit well into Wilson's new diplomacy, as well as his vision regarding the right of self-determination for national groups and the kind of political regime and constitution they should build for themselves. Truman's advisors repeated this theme about three decades later during an argument that took place in the White House between the US Secretary of State George Marshall and President Truman's political advisor Clifford Clark over the question whether the United States should grant recognition to Israel after it declared independence. Marshall, who was against granting recognition, argued that the state of Israel would destabilize the Middle East, while Clark argued that on the contrary, a democratic Jewish state would be a stabilizing element. Truman preferred his advisor position over his Secretary of State's and the argument that Israel was and probably is the only democracy in an undemocratic region justified American support for of Israel in the eyes of presidents since then. American presidents justified their support of Israel also because it was a legitimate member of the international community, whose establishment was sanctioned first by the League of Nations and then reiterated by the United Nations November 1947 partition resolution. When he debated whether to grant recognition to the state of Israel, to the state declared on May 15, 1948, Truman considered this as a promise that should be kept, just as all promises made by responsible civilized governments should be kept. The legitimacy of Israel and its right to, secure to a secure existence were fundamental themes that American officials, from the president down the ladder, reiterated throughout the years. Jewish history was also was another argument justifying the American strong attachment to Israel. During the 19th century, mainline American Protestants felt guilty for the Christianity's historical treatment of the Jews and the unspeakable cruelties they had suffered at the hands of European Christians for hundreds of years. President Eisenhower, who is considered as the less, as the less friendly president to Israel, wrote in his diary in early 1956 following an announcement that Egypt had received a large amount of modern combat jets and tanks from Czechoslovakia. Quote, Israel has a very strong position in the heart and emotions of the Western world because of its tragic suffer of the tra tragic suffering of the Jews throughout 2,500 years of history. The Holocaust only strengthened that sentiment. This was a sensitive issue mainly among mainline Protestants because of the intellectual leadership the German Protestant Church provided to the American Protestant Church. The passive support of the German Protestant Church and its followers of the Nazi rule deeply shocked American Protestants. In 1942, in the middle of the Second World War, a group of Protestants established the Christian Council on Palestine with Reinhold Niebuhr as one of its members. The group's purpose was 
to arouse Christian concern and actions in light of Hitler's persecution of the Jews and to draw the attention to Palestine as the only available refuge for the Jews. President Truman was, of course, and this is quotation from his saying, horrified by the Holocaust, and President Jimmy Carter stated that memories of the Holocaust are still alive. Ronald Reagan was also committed. The Holocaust, I believe, left America with moral responsibility to ensure that what had happened to the Jews under Hitler never happens again. The idea that the Jewish state's existence was justified because of the legitimate rights of the Jews to self-determination and because of the Jewish history permeated beyond the circles of the administration. In the introduction to their controversial book, controversial book The Israel Lobby and the U.S. Foreign Policy, Mirsheimer and Walt refute any claim that they aim to question the legitimacy of Israel. Israeli leaders, on their part, did not hesitate using the Holocaust as a reminder and the reason for the United States to support Israel. David Ben-Gurion would reiterate this theme time and again in his contacts with various American presidents. On one occasion, in a letter he sent to President John F. Kennedy in June 1962, Ben-Gurion justified Israel's request for arms in the following argument. And I would like to emphasize one argument here, which you can read. What was done to six million of our brethren 20 years ago could be done to the two million Jews of Israel if, God forbid, the IDF are defeated. And I would like to emphasize that because the thought, and we will see that uh, uh, later on again, the thought is not only that the existence of the state of Israel is in risk. It is the people of Israel who are under the threat of annihilation. A direct line leads from this message to Benjamin Netanyahu's insistence that Israel was still facing a threat of second Holocaust, this time from Iran, fighting against the treaty negotiated with Iran over its nuclear program. Once again, Netanyahu stated, just as the Nazis thought to crush, sought to crush civilization and impose in itself a master race, so Iran seeks to dominate the region while it's declaring or its declared intention of destroying the Jewish state. These arguments did find a chord in American hearts. Religion, value, and history seem to put the United States on a predetermined course in its attitude toward Israel. But can we say the same thing about Israel's association with the United States? Was it only natural for Israel to seek a special relationship with the United States, or was it a matter of convenience and expediency, with Israel wishing to rely on the strongest power in the world? The truth of the matter is that unlike the nature of American foreign policy, the Zionist and Israel's foreign policy was more pragmatic and realistic than ideological. From the very first date of its existence, the Zionist leaders attributed high importance to the support of a great power in the Zionist project. Herzl tried and failed to recruit the Ottoman Empire and later, later the German Kaiser to the Zionist cause. The Zionists were more successful in their attempts to recruit Britain. One major result of that was, of course, the Balfour Declaration. And later, when it was given mandate over Palestine, the British practically acted to carry out the obligation they made in the Balfour Declaration. However, the British chapter in the history of the Zionist movement ended in May, in May 1939, when the British government published a white paper that set very strict limits on the immigration of Jews to Palestine and limited significantly the ability of Jews in Palestine to purchase lands, mainly from Arabs. The Zionist movement sought now a new ally, and the natural alternative was the United States. David Ben-Gurion, the head of the Jewish community in Palestine during the years of the mandate, and Israel's first prime minister, was well familiar with the United States. 
He visited the United States for the first time in May 1915, during which he met Paula Monbez, who became his wife. This first visit was followed by many others. During his visits, Ben-Gurion used to spend a lot of time at the New York Public Library, reading extensively about the history of the United States, its political system, and particularly how policy was shaped in that most developed and democratic of nations, quote, unquote. This is from Ben-Gurion's diary. Throughout his observation and study, Ben-Gurion came to appreciate both the American people and the American institutions. He saw a resemblance between the Zionist and the American pioneers and admired what those pioneers had achieved. However, for Ben-Gurion, the more important, the more significant lesson and experience was the American political system, which gave power to public opinion. Ben-Gurion was especially impressed by the way American Irish had managed during the 1920s to become a pressure group that mobilized American public opinion and gained America's support for independent Irish state. The Jews should do the same, he thought, for Israel. The free speech, free thought, free press, free communication, so abundant in the United States, argued Ben-Gurion, made it the most viable place for Zionists to mobilize the masses, Jews as well as non-Jews, toward their cause. In an address he delivered in, October, in August 1951 to the to an American Zionist organization, he described the role he expected the American Jews to play in advocating Israel. Zionists to live in free and democratic countries should help Israel. There were about six million Jews in the United States in 1948 small percentage within the total of the American population, but their cohesiveness and organization made them a political power to reckon with. Such as, some such as Wirschheimer and Walt even blame that they got excessive influence over US foreign policy. And again, I won't uh, discuss here the truth of that argument. I'll only mention that some of the critics attribute much more power to the Jews than they really have while others interpret the idea of national security in accordance to their own specific interests. At the same time, it is impossible to deny that the Jews as collective did and do have political power beyond their number in society. Even if it took a while before the Jews became a political power, they are today. During the 1930s and 1940s, out of about 6 million American Jews, only about 100,000 to 150,000 were Zionists. The rest were non or anti-Zionist, which is not the same. During those years, the Jewish community as a whole became the richest community among Jews in the world and the, rich, and the um, richest ethnical community in the United States. Still, they were careful in practicing their power. They were careful not to give anyone the reason, a reason to doubt their loyalty to the United States and to blame them that they were more loyal to Israel. Where they were involved in Jewish affairs, mainly outside of the United States, they were mainly involved in humanitarian and philanthropic activities. They refrained from involvement in Zionist national affairs. David Ben-Gurion was aware of the American Jews' concern, and in 1950 he pledged not to put the American Jews in a situation where their loyalty to the, United, to the United States would be questioned. However, with time, the American Jews were moving from concern over their place in the American society into growing awareness of their power within the United States. They became more and more pub politically active and began to express their support of Israel in a more direct way. The American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, better known as APAC, has been established in 1951, and it increased the volume of its activities in the next years. Philip Klatznik, one of the leaders of the Jewish community in the United States, outlined in July 1979 the logic of the American Jews' actions. As an American Jew, I have dual obligation, obligation to the United States, but also as a Jew to Israel. The nature of American Jewish involvement in the Zionist project has changed 
and with the change in challenges the Zionist movement was facing throughout the years. Until 1948, the main goal of the Zionists was to bring to successful, to successful conclusion, from the Zionist perspective of course, the discussions over the fate of Palestine. To that end, the Zionists sought the American support for the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. The American Jews took part in the campaign toward that end, and along with religion, ideas, and history, the Zionist diplomats and the American Jews were instrumental in President Truman's decision to support the partition resolution, and six months later, after the establishment of the State of Israel, to Truman's quick announcement recognizing the State of Israel. When the diplomatic campaign was over, the Zionist movement faced new challenge, the need to ensure the survival of the new state of Israel. With that, Israeli expectations from the United States had changed. More than diplomatic support, the Israelis expected mili military assistance, and the American Jews helped Israel to achieve that goal. Despite the victory in the 1948 war, or maybe because of it, Ben-Gurion and his generation believed that Jewish state and people were still in great danger. Israel, small in size and population, geostrategically vulnerable, was surrounded by still hostile neighbors who, so believed the Israeli leaders and people, were determined to take a revenge of their defeat in the 1948 war. It was a given to Ben-Gurion and the people of Israel at the time that the second round of hostilities between Israel and its neighbors was in inevitable and imminent. Israel was strong enough at that point, the years immediately after the war, to defeat such an attack. However, Ben-Gurion argued that while the Arabs could sustain an unlimited number of defeats, for Israel, the first defeat will be the last one. Ben-Gurion was convinced that the Arab goal in such a war would not be to occupy Israel, but also to annihilate the Jewish people in Israel. Making some concluding remarks about the 1948 war, Ben-Gurion said the following, and once again emphasizing the threat not only to the Jewish state, but to the Jewish people. Ben-Gurion's conclusion was, that in, the light, in light of the still looming imminent existence threat facing it, Israel must be strong, and it would be strong only if it could be morally, economically, technologically, scientifically, educationally, and militarily superior to its neighbors. One major mean to ensure Israel's existence would be forging an alliance with a great power and securing unobstructed access to a major arms supplier. The almost natural target would be the United States, for the reasons I mentioned before. That wish to make the United States Israel's major arms supplier was both a mean and an end. Israel wanted arms that would allow it to meet the imminent Arab attack, but no less important, Ben-Gurion and those around him assumed that an American agreement to provide arms to Israel would be also a sign of American commitment to Israel's security, which was Israel's ultimate goal. The Israels were right in principle assuming that the United States would stand by Israel. As odd as it may sound, there was and still is an asymmetry in the Israel-American relations, but not the one that you would immediately think about. The asymmetry is not between a great superpower to a tiny country. The asymmetry is between a nation that feels intellectual, religious, and even moral bond and commitment to the other. There is asymmetry between the actual size and power of the one as compared to the other and the deep commitment the great power felt toward the tiny country. Religious values and history led presidents and the American people to accept the Israeli narrative as, their place, as to their place in history, as to their belonging and ties to the land of Israel, and more concretely, as to the meaning and nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict. After all, they were part of the story that called for the restoration of the Jewish state, and they were actively involved in the process that made that happening. And so, nearly 70 years after the establishment of the State of Israel, in the eulogy he delivered at Shimon Peres' funeral, just recently, 
President Barack Obama could describe the post-1948 period in words that resembled those used by Ben-Gurion at the time. After independence, surrounded by enemies who denied Israel's existence and sought to drive it into the sea. This is a statement that every Zionist leader would sign. This is the story the Israelis tell themselves about their past, and this was and apparently still is the narrative that American presidents from Truman to Obama shared. And it made it obvious for them and to the American people that the United States was committed to Israel's existence and well-being. The problem from the Israeli perspective was that there were differences between the way the Israelis saw their security environment, the threats and the ways to deal with the threats, and the way the Americans saw it. To some extent, a large part of the history of the Israel-American relations is the story of the Israeli attempts to close that gap between the way they understood their environment and the way the Americans understood it. Every American president, from Truman to Obama, tried to find the balance between Israel's security needs, as he understood it, and the American regional and sometimes world interests. Whenever they could, the Americans would give priority to their regional and world interests. However, when Israel's security seems to be under major threat, the Americans would give a priority over their, would give that priority over their regional interests. So the Israeli main task during the years, during the years was to close the gap. And they had to fight it and to go through a process of to accomplish two things. One was to convince the Americans that they were under grave danger and they needed arms, and to convince the Americans that doing so would serve better American interests than relying on the Arab countries. The gap between the way Israel understood its strategic situation and the way the Americans saw it was the widest during Israel's first decade of existence. During those years, with the Cold War raging on, the United States' prime concern in the Middle East was to keep it within the Western sphere and to prevent the entry of the Soviet Union into the region. Hence, the Truman and Eisenhower administrations refrained from taking actions that would alienate the Arab states, mostly refraining from being viewed as blatant pro-Israeli. That meant, among other things, rejecting the Israeli requests for arms and security guarantees. And so, the Truman and Eisenhower administrations limited their support to Israel to the most needed economic assistance, and even that had been given as part of American international aid program and not directly as an aid to Israel. When it came to arms requests, these were denied. The Truman and Eisenhower administrations insisted that Israel was strong enough to meet any Arab military challenge, and when President Eisenhower felt that indeed the arms balance tilted against Israel, he encouraged other countries to sell major arms systems to Israel. In 1955, he encouraged France, France to do that, and in 1958, it was Britain. In the early 1960s, the Kennedy and later the Johnson administration encouraged Germany to sell to Israel tanks. The Israelis were, of course, disappointed by the American refusal to sell the major arms systems, but not surprised. The Israelis were, were well aware that when the United States dealt with them, they did it in the context of the U.S. Middle Eastern policy, certainly when it comes to Israel's request for arms and security guarantees. Israel's foreign minister phrased it concisely in 1950. For us, the issue is our relations with the United States. For the United States, the issue is the Middle East. At the same time, the Israelis knew that they have opened doors to the State Department and to some extent to the White House. With time, the White House doors would, be, would open even wider. That meant that the Israelis could explain their position and needs to American officials, and the Americans, along the whole ladder, listened attentively. 
The Israelis made two major claims in justification for their, for their request for arms, which for the Israelis meant also security guarantees. First, the Israelis argued that the Arabs, and mostly the Egyptian leader, Gamal Abdul Nasser, were planning to resume the fighting against Israel, and their goal would be, again, not only destroying Israel, but annihilating the Israeli people. And again, we have a quote from David Ben-Gurion on that matter. The second argument was that Israel, and not the Arab countries, and especially Egypt, was the West's true ally. The Israeli diplomats said to the American diplomats repeatedly that Egypt would not fight alongside the West against the Soviet Union. The, this argument gained more power following Nasser's announcement in September 1955 that Czechoslovakia agreed to sell to Egypt significant number of modern tanks and combat jets. The arms deal meant that Egypt openly dissociated itself from the West and got closer to the Soviet Union. And the Israelis warned time and again that Nasser was acting to make Egypt the hegemonic power in the Middle East under the auspices of the Soviet Union. Israel, on the other hand, was a Western bastion in a hostile area that came under Soviet influence. The Israelis made similar argument after the Six-Day War, explaining to the Americans that Israel's victory in the war prevented at the last hour Nazarite takeover of the Middle East under Soviet inspiration. In a process that took several years, Israel managed to get what it was asking for. The Americans agreed that within their Cold War and Middle Eastern policies, it was U.S. national interest to get closer to Israel. The Israelis managed to convince the Americans that indeed Israel should get the arms it was asking for. I won't go into the historical process that made these things happening. Instead, I would like to discuss a bit the way Israel managed to take an active part in the American decision-making process and to take part in the making of American policy toward Israel. It did so by having constant dialogue with the Americans and by using the impact and influence of two groups. The Jews and Protestants. As I mentioned earlier, American Jews acted more and more to have impact on American policy toward Israel. Sorry. A word of warranty. There is a huge literature on the complex relations between the American Jews and Israel. Arguments over the meaning of diaspora and Zionism the occupation and settlement as against the return to ancestral inheritance, Israel's Orthodox Judaism as against the reform and conservative forms of Judaism, all these exist within the United States and among the Jews there. But it is still possible to speak about a significant number of Jews who, despite the arguments and controversies, stood and still stand by Israel and speak on her behalf. And American politicians, American politicians from both parties in general, and presidents especially, since Truman, were attentive to what the Jews had to say on matters pertinent to Israel. Prominent Jews like Abraham Feinberg and Max Fischer had close ties with presidents. Feinberg was an advisor on Israeli affairs to Truman, Kennedy, and Johnson, sometimes officially, most of the times unofficially. Fisher worked for about 40 years with American presidents on Jewish and Israeli issues. His strongest connection was with President Richard Nixon. Both Feinberg and Fisher had strong connections with Israel and served as liaisons for both countries. Israel diplomats delivered through American Jews messages regarding issues that matter to Israel or asked the Jews to exert pressure on the members of the administration either directly or through their congressional representatives when necessary. Many petitions presented by members of Congress or the public in favor of Israel were initiated by Israeli diplomats in Washington. More than that, as Jeremy Seri has shown in his study on Henry Kissinger, American Jews climbed along the ladder within the government, holding high rank positions in the State Department and the White House. They worked, of course, for the American government and were no less loyal to the United States than their non-Jews peers. But they found it easier to discuss with the Israelis 
and in return, in, and in turn, found it Israel to deal with them. I would like to give one example, which is a bit off mark, but still, I believe, indicative. Going back to the conversation I started with between Kissinger and Dinitz, at the end of that conversation, Kissinger took aside Dinitz, and uh, to remind you, the conversation were about the shipment of arms, either yes or no, shipment of arms to Israel at the midst of the 1973 October war. And then in the end of the conversation, Dinitz reported that Kissinger took him aside and now I'm quoting, I hope that it is here. No, it's not here. So you have to trust me. In a choking voice, so reports Dinitz, in a choking voice Kissinger said, as long as I'm here, I will not abandon Israel. Now, I'm not sure if I need to say that, but Henry Kissinger was a Jew. For the one who didn't know that. Now, more than one American president made such pledge to Israeli prime minister. It was not the first time that American president or official said that he will not abandon Israel. But it was never said in such a sentimental manner and certainly not in a choking voice. That is, Kissinger would not say or do anything that any other member of the administration would have done. However, there was an attachment, a connection that made the exchange and communication easier to have between the Israelis and Americans such as Kissinger. The Israeli diplomats kept close ties also with Protestants, mainly with the Evangelical Church, which is the larger among the American Christian churches, both Protestant and Catholic. And this is the time for the next slide. No, where I, no. Here it is. So a survey conducted by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life in 2008 has shown the membership in the American churches, which is divided as follows. And for us, the more important element is the Evangelical Protestant churches. They are the largest within the American Christian community. The Israelis did not take for granted the support of the evangelicals of Israel, and they actively pursued and encouraged Protestants who were ready to stand by Israel. One interesting example is the case of Professor Frank Inglitel, a Protestant minister who served in Germany after the Second World War as a chief Protestant religious advisor in the high command assigned especially to the task of denazification. When he came back to the United States, after 10 years of service, he advanced the Holocaust studies in the United States. Some consider him to be the founder of the field of Holocaust studies in the United States. In 1970, he established an organization called Concerned Christians for Israel, and he sent letters to about 450 priests and ministers asking them to join him in order to prevent, in order that Hitler's plan not be repeated against the survivors of Israel. No, this is the end of it. Later worked very closely with the Israeli consul in Philadelphia, and in fact, Little used the council's office and private residence as his and his organization's spiritual and political headquarters. The Israeli diplomats estimated that the work of the dedicated Christians like Little had impact. An example to such an impact was a poll conducted in 1970 showing that there was increase in the number of Southern Baptist clergy and educators who defined themselves as pro-Israeli by 10% as compared to the year before. The Consul General who reported the poll mentioned that he had no doubt that the Southern Baptist Church leadership was the main reason for the improvement. Sometimes though, things could be bizarre. In July 1970, a Baptist preacher named Gerald Young approached Israeli consul in Houston and drew his attention to the chapters in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel where the prophets discussed the ways God would punish Egypt. That in 1970, at that time in 1970, there was still a war between Israel and Egypt called the War of Attrition. So the preacher suggested that in order to implement the prophecies, that suggested the destruction of Egypt, Israel should divert the Nile and deprive water from Egypt. 
The consul explained to the preacher that Israel would never take part in a genocide, as that was uh, the diversion of the Nile would mean. But nonetheless, the preacher insisted that the consul should send back the, to Jerusalem his recommendation, and the consul did that. And this is how we know about it, because I read it. And now, thinking about that, I don't know if, you, if anyone remember, but today's Israel Minister of Security, Avigdor Lieberman at the time, suggested to bomb the Aswan Dam. And now I know where he got that idea from. These were the white circles through which the Israelis communicated with the administration. The more significant and influential process was the direct communication between the Israeli heads of state, their lieutenants and diplomats with their American counterparts. It is almost obvious that the American ambassador in Israel would have open access to everyone he wished to speak with in Israel, from the prime minister all the way down the ladder. But the Israeli ambassador in Washington also had open doors to various members of the administration in various levels and he always found a ready-to-listen ear. The story with which I started my presentation tells it all, in a way. In a nutshell, this is how the Israeli-American special relationships look like. Israeli and American high-ranking officials talked with each other with no hindrance. They would listen to each other, allowing the other to convince them. And when American interests clashed, with what the Israelis assumed was their national security interests, the Americans would weight one against the other. And when they accepted, and where they accepted the Israeli claims, they would subdue American interests in favor of Israel's security needs. Policy had been made in, not only in Washington. It was a mutual process where the voices and interests of both countries were considered and measured, religious, religion, ideals and history were the three pillars and bedrocks upon which the interests were weighted and dialogue would flourish. The interests of each country not always aligned, but they were superseded by the constants or at least became a matter of discussions and negotiations which Israel and the United States could have in such an intimate manner. Does it all mean that the American-Israeli relations will continue to remain special also in the future? Probably. Why think, one thing I can promise you, if that won't be the case, I will be able to explain that too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Clive Webb. I'm the head of the School of History, Art History and uh, Philosophy here at the University of Sussex and uh, entirely coincidentally uh, David's line manager. Um, I've been asked uh, this evening to provide David with a little bit of assessment and feedback on his performance. Uh, so here goes. Uh, David's appointment as Yossi Harel Chair of Israel Studies is, as the Vice Chancellor said at the outset, uh, central to Sussex's increasingly global approach to the study of history and specifically its investment in the study of the Middle East and North Africa, including the creation of an important new research center under the direction of my, under the directorship of my colleague Hilary Kalmbach. The lecture you've heard this evening is evidence of the intellectual repayment on that investment. The past is never dead, observed the novelist William Faulkner. It's not even past. The lecture we've just had the pleasure to hear demonstrates the salience of this observation. In casting new light on its historical origins and development, David has provided us with a clearer context for understanding the contemporary and future traje trajectory of the Israeli-American special relationship. Sussex historians have a long and honorable tradition of confronting difficult and contentious topics. In this particular instance, David has provided dispassionate insight into a profoundly politicized issue that has often attracted more heat than light. His close reading of Israeli sources forces us to reconsider the dynamics of its diplomatic, military, and intelligence ties to the United States. As David observes, in a line of analysis consistent with recent academic literature on US foreign policy, the United States supports Israel not only out of strategic self-interest, but also 
out of deep-rooted historical and cultural affinities. Predominantly secular European scholars of the United States are often neglectful of the religious impulses that inform American thought, culture, and public policy, particularly in the arena of international relations. And David's lecture, I think, is an important corrective to that. For even further corroboration uh, of his thesis that the religious thought of Americans has been a defining uh, force in shaping the Israeli-US special relationship, he could even look further beyond uh, conventional diplomatic sources to US popular culture. And I couldn't resist the opportunity to quote the great expert and sage on US-Israeli spe uh, US special relations, the country singer Johnny Cash, who following his pilgrimage to Israel in the 1970s composed a song, I am not going to uh, try to sing it uh, uh, and to try to copy his inimitable voice, uh, the land of Israel, from the top of Sinai to the Sea of Galilee, every hill and plain is home, every place is dear to me. There's that evangelical Protestant voice coming through loud and clear. Moreover, what David's lecture reveals is that while the United States' attitude towards Israel may be influenced by a combination of idealistic principle and political pragmatism, Israel has aligned itself with the United States, not out of any innate affinity with the country, but rather sharp political calculation. Israel may have a special relationship with the United States, but it is often one of the head rather than one of the heart. What I think is also important uh, thinking more broadly here about David's lecture is how instructive it is to scholars of US foreign policy in general. The United States, of course, proclaims to have many special relationships, foremost with our own country. David's lecture raises the issue ultimately of what is special of about any of the special relationships that the United States has with Britain, with Germany, with Pakistan, with any uh, country that it has claimed to have such a relationship with, and in particular in foregrounding the importance of historical contingency, I think he has done us all an important service. So David, my assessment is that this is a first class lecture, Pass. and feeding forward, we look forward, we look forward to the further development of your path-breaking research. Ladies and gentlemen, please extend a further show of appreciation to Professor David Tal. That's it, I can die now, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly how, time, how, how much time do we have. Well, the only thing that um, is standing between the last one is the number of questions you get. <laughs> Here you have. So, yeah. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Uh, it was very instructive. I'm intrigued by this emphasis on the Judeo-Christian links that Israel has, in particular on the emphasis on the evangelical Protestant churches. Many of these often small churches have a, a kind of fundamentalist view about the Jews in Israel where they envisage a sort of final battle in which the Jews have the option of being converted by them or being destroyed. I'm slightly puzzled as to why we get the Judeo-Christian thing pushed so much. And that is the backdrop to a lot of the fundamentalist Christian beliefs. Yeah. No, you know, it's, it's just uh, when I was uh, um, young, I think, yeah, I was working on my PhD dissertation. I uh, visited the Truman Library at the Independence, Missouri. And I was staying, I was then student, so I, I, well, it was the kind of the, that time, uh, uh, Airbnb. I, I was uh, staying uh, at the house of uh, a guy who was a farmer, a very good Christian. And, and we were talking, and he expressed his, uh, his uh, support and sympathy to Israel based on his Christianity. And I explained to him how his Christianity basically aimed to, well, destroy me. But still, we had very nice conversations. But, but uh, there are two things about that. First, uh, the, the premillennialists, dispensationalists, who are those who held that vision, 
they are relatively the minority within the evangelical community because there are also the fundamentalists, those who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. That is, they took it as literally saying the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. This is what God said to Abraham. So that's it, without too much thinking. And second, and this I say as a secular, I'm ready to wait to that point when Jesus will come. And that's fine. So that goes, that goes with the point, no, that goes with the point that Clive made that emphasized the, the realistic approach of, of Israel, the real politic approach that says, you are ready to support us now. Okay, we will go with that. And, and when Jesus Christ will come, we'll deal with that then. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 yeah, this is this is the argument. This is the argument that uh, that is made from time to time. That is that the United States agreed to give Israel the the phantoms and all the weapons in order to prevent a nuclear strike by Israel. Uh, and that uh, claim is made mainly by people who didn't really read the documents, because in the documents there is no mention at all to that option. Absolutely. And all the, and we have a lot, a lot. It's kind of the problem is not to get documents about the exchanges between Israel and the United States on that subject. The problem is not to get drawn by these documents. There are so many. So, so we know, and I can tell kind of, you know, there might some paper will pop up and, and will change the picture. But from what we have, and we got plenty, the nuclear thing was completely not on the table. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here. No, it was it. Yeah, no, no, it it, it didn't really have an effect. I mean, on on broad in broad. Uh, picture of things. No, it, it, you know the story is, is about the during the Six Day War Israel attacked by mistake uh, an American intelligence ship called Liberty which was uh, uh, kind of uh, shipping around the shores of Israel and Egypt uh, and it was almost immediately from the very beginning it was clear that it was a mistake and Israel made it very clear in the very beginning when it happened, when it became clear what happened, Israel immediately reported to the uh, American embassy in Tel Aviv and then again in Washington and immediately said, look, we give you an access to all the information we have. So no, it didn't really have an impact on, on the relationship between the two states. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all.